All right, now, in, in, in continuing, we're going to take, take a little pause. We're going to continue with this, this lecture and this teaching on um, circumcision and getting into the mystery of this. Remember, the New Testament gives us some, some great keys where it says in Acts of the Apostles 7 and 22 that um, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in word and deed. That's why it's left up to him to tell the story. Now, when we go right here, continuing where we were at right around here, we're going to skip over Janes or Yah, Yah, Yahweh Nasi right here. But maybe we shouldn't because the altar of Janes was erected by Moses, by Mashu, and identified that Jah as the black God. You see this right here? This is why they suppressed Macy's work, that Jah is the black God. The sun in darkness, or the Aten, the Adon in the underworld, or the Adon, the Adonai of the West, the deity of the Henwood part, the lower, the lower heaven. Now, in the Hebrew, we have um, um, Neseha, or the Neseha, for excrement, the Netsi for excrement, or, you know, like doodle. And this agrees with the Nessi from Egypt, which means the fowl, or the black, filthy fowl in one, the bird of night, or the bird of the henward part. But let's not get this twisted, because I know there's a lot of um, racist things in white supremacy, but white supremacy sought to suppress this teaching right here. Now, when interpreted by the mythos, there still appear in the Abrahamic story a current and a coloring from the land of Aram or Mesopotamia. Now, the genetrix, Jehovah, is superseded by the Adonaiim of Abram. In other words, at one time, the mother goddess, you understand, the mother goddess and diva cults, that God was known as Jehovah, she. She God, when the goddess and the motherhood, you understand, when the motherhood and son, sonship, when there was no fatherhood, the fatherhood was not recognized and known. So we have the genetrix, you understand, the genetrix Jehovah that is superseded by the Adonaiim of Abram, the divinity of a new covenant, a new and a better covenant where fatherhood was recognized, the token or the sign of which was the right of circumcision. Now, this changes exactly what occurs with Moses and Joshua after the exodus from Egypt. Then Adonai, as Jah, or as Yah, is made known as a new deity to Musa, to Mashu, or to Moses. And the rite of circumcision is enforced by Joshua. But we have an earlier story with Zipporah where it seems like Moses almost forgot to do it, and Yahweh was so incensed by this act. You understand? Because if he had, by this, this foundational act, that according to Moses' own second book, Exodus, that Yahweh Jah wanted to kill him until his wife, his Ethiopian, the Medeanite wife, she did it and she said, you're a bloody husband to me, and she repeated herself twice for a good um, ancient effect. Right? Now, here it says, then Adonai, how many times, how many times have I said this? <laughs> then Adonai, Jah, is made known as a new deity to Moses in the rite of circumcision enforced by Iyasu or Yeshua, Yehoshua, Joshua of the Old Testament with the people who had been, with the people who had been a reproach of Egypt. Similar to how niggers and black folks are a reproach of white supremacy even today. Thus, the same thing, the introduction of a new divinity and the rite of circumcision takes place for the first time twice over. Also, the different deities are identical. This proves the existence of two currents, one coming from the Mesopotamian source and the other from the Egyptian or the Ethiopic source. But whether it's ethnological and to what extent or only mythological is another question. The same myth here 
have fresh starting points. But in the celestial allegory, only can these be unified. Two sources for the same mythical matter can be established, but these only serve so far to prove the matter to be doubly mythical or according to the mishtir, the mystery of God and Christ, and will not help us to make Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob into historical personages. personages. Now, some would think that Macy tries to... Um, discount the history, but Macy is discounting the white, the whitewash, white supremacy perversion of it, but showing in his works that if there's any truth to this, and even any history to it, it must be black, it must be African, it must be coming out of inner Africa from, from its source in Ethiopia, and the real Jews are the black Jews. This is, this, is, this is what Macy basically proves. So when you're reading in some of his works and he is discounting some of the historical, don't get in a whitewashed Christian mentality, but recognize that his main focus of furious rebukes is this whitewash, this whitewashing of Christianity and ancient Egypt and a denying out of racist and demonic intent the truth of the word and the history because of racist, you know, you know, where they don't want to admit that Christ is black because they are still demon possessed. Still, we repeat, there are two traceable currents, and the matter that meets in the Hebrew writings must have met there by two different channels, which appear to emanate from Egypt and from Mesopotamia. Now, let us continue. Let us continue with this. Now, I think now we're going to get to the main point that when we went over this, we said we have to touch on this, especially for this time of Sukkot. You understand? Now, here you will see the god uh, Sukkot. Now, if you go to, as we've been in Amos, Amos chapter 5, if you return to Amos chapter 5, and Amos chapter 5 has something very cryptic, that a lot of people have speculated on. Some say that the star is the five-pointed star. Some say the star is the six-pointed star. Some say this and some say that. But Macy is probably one of the few, you understand, one of the few that's even worthy of the title of, of Egyptologist, you understand, that touched on the point and wasn't afraid to call a spade a spade or black, black. Now, here there was a god called Sikut, Sikut, sounds close to um, Sukkot because there is some etymological um, relations and linguistics in that word. Now, Sukkot, the god Sukkot, it typified the emasculated or castrated divinity who was the crut of mythology, otherwise the child. Now, let's look at Amos again, Amos chapter 5, verse 26 where it says, or verse 25 and 26, Have ye offered to me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? But ye have borne the tabernacle, or the sikut, of your molech, or your king, your demon king, and kiun, and the kun, the kun, or the female goddess, your images, and the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. And because of that, in verse 27, Yahweh says, Therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith Yahweh, whose name is, whose name is the Elohim of the Tzabaot. Now, Sikut, the real point of Amos chapter 5 and verse 26 where it's talking about the tabernacles of your Molech and Kiyun. The real mystery of this is Sukkot. Let's begin with Sukkot. King James translated it as tabernacles, but more correctly, it was talking about the god Sukkot, who represented and typified the emasculated or the castrated divinity. This is basically the, the nigger, the negro, the black man in America, is that castrated or emasculated divinity who was the crude of mythology, otherwise the child. Or you might hear ones talk about the man-child. He was the man-child. Now, the, the Seki, 
means in the Hebrew the castrated one. In the Hebrew, the seki is the castrated one. In the north of England, the castrated bull is still called a seg. Now, u sukat in Assyrian, it means to cut, to wound sacrificially. Now, in the Egyptian, this is the sukhat, the sukhat, which means to cut or to wound as a sacrifice. In English, sacrificing, even the word sacrifice has that etymological root, is a name of scarifying, of scarifying. And cutting the flesh was a sacred mode of memorizing, of extending to castration in the most fanatical, the most fanatical phase of circumcision. And this is what we're witnessing even with the female genital mutilation and these other versions of um, circumcision, which if done improperly, you understand, at too late a date, it wounds the glands and could make some males um, um, infertile you understand, or fruitless. Now, the identity of the male organ and the memorial under the name of Zakar. In fact, in the Bible, when Yahweh first or God first made man in his image after his likeness, you know the part where it says male and female? It says male and female, he created them. Or Zakar where Nikabal. Zakar when the Kabar. If you read the Hebrew, you'll see that when it says male and female, it calls this male, male and female couple, not Adam, but Zakar where and Nikabar or Inkabar or Inkabar, if you pronounce it from a more Afro, uh, African perspective. Now, Zakar is the identity of the male organ in the memorial. This is why we have these stellas and these obeliscus. You understand, when we look at these obelisks, it's only in Ethiopia that we find the circumcised obelisk, believe it or not, the circumcised. Look at the Ethiopian obelisk and then look at the Egyptian obelisk. The Egyptian obelisk, quite interestingly enough, is uncircumcised. Now, the identity of the male organ and the memorial under the name of Zakar, which likewise means to cut, imprint, and cause to remember, is derived from the, the early ideas of sacrificing, the early ideas of sacrificing. The Hebrew name for sacrifice as the meat offering for remembrance is called the Azkara, the Azkara. The Azkara or the Azikara, the Azikara is derivable from the As in Egyptian, which means to sacrifice, and Kar. Kar in ancient Egyptian is the male power and the property. This is interesting that the male power is called Kar and property is called Kar, expressed by the Kariu, the Kariu for the testes, the balls. In other words, is the Kariu. The seed that was passed through the fire to Molech. The seed that was passed through the fire to Molech. And there's people today who worship Molech, like your leaders and the, your, your system lords, the Balaam. They worship Molech in the Bavarian Grove, that owl kind of sacrifice where they have an effigy of a little baby, so forth and so on. And they understand probably these rites because they derive power from these um, hyperdimensional uh, demonic entities. Now, the sinking sun, the sinking sun was represented as being, as being in this emasculated condition, the sinking sun. You know, when I look at Obama's symbol, which is a sun, obviously, is it a rising sun or a sinking sun? You remember um, George, uh, not George Bush, who was it, Clinton? He said something that the such and such a sun, it's not a, it's not a sinking sun, it's a rising sun. Because you really can't tell at that particular point. When you see, like, the Shell logo, they tell us that it's a rising sun. Well, God damn it. You understand, how come their sun hasn't arrived? It's really the sinking sun. And this is represented as being in this emasculated condition. Those who made themselves eunuchs 
were assimilating their condition to his. In other words, those who worship the, the, the white Jesus, the antichrist image, especially as, as black Hebrews, is all, they are also assimilating their condition. So they give their, they sacrifice their manhood to the image of the beast. Understand this. And to be carved to be carved or cut, literally gelt, you know the word gelt, G-E-L-T, it was to become like this so-called divine child, the emasculated and crippled child, actually, of the so-called virgin mother. We're talking about of the old version. Now, the reproach of Egypt, it consisted of this kind of circumcision, the reproach, that which was called the reproach of Egypt. Now, this is all very interesting because the character of the emasculated, or we can call it effeminized, or the unveral, the unveral sun god, was still continued in Ptah Sakari. Ptah Sakari and the mutilated Osiris. You know what's similar to the mutilated Osiris? If you want to see the real time images, look at some of the images of lynched black men. This is why when they lynch black men, what do they do? They cut off their gonads, their balls, their testicles. Why? After the eunuch making had been repudiated by the Egyptians. So even the Egyptians, in, from a sociological perspective, advanced and evolved beyond the older types to a more refined perspective. But there were some who went back. It, like I said, when the dog, the dog returned to its vomit and the pig, after being washed, goes back to wallowing in the mud. That's a male and a female type. The dog is the male and the female is the pig in that particular biblical parable. Now, this circumcision is denoted by the word, by the word that we have here of, of harak, of harak which means disgrace and shame. It is applied to being violated, being violated and deflowered, much like the prison industrial complex and the, all the experiences of black men in America basically is a violation, is a deflowering, stripped of honor, made naked, divested, to be cut into, to pull and to prick, to pluck the fruit, to be made desolate, an object of scorn, all of which meanings fit the so-called eunuch, the emasculated male. Now, when we think about this, we have to ask ourselves, well, when they, when they, when they lynched a the black man, I mean, they, they already hung him, why in the world? Would they also cut off his balls and his penis and put it in a pickle jar? And it seems like all these demonic white folks, they knew, they knew what was going on. Now we're beginning to learn exactly what was going on. You understand? The word kerp or kerp in the Egyptian kerp, it means first fruits. It means to consecrate to pay homage. The first kind of circumcision was a dedication of the first fruits of the male at the shrine of the virgin mother and child. So I submit to you that the lynching in America was the same sort of, of dedication of the first fruits of the young black males and the black males to the shrine of the so-called Columbia virgin, so-called goddess, and the whitewashed Jesus child, the, the, the fake, the counterfeit, which was one way of passing seed, passing seed through the fire to Molech, to Molech. But my brother and sister, if you're up for this, there's a little bit more, because here it says that the Hebrew, the Hebrew um, oat or out, out, uh, where to out or contracted out, it modifies into at or into et. And the et of sukut and the kivan, which in your Bibles you have as kiun in Amos chapter 5, verse 26, as before already suggested, it represents the aft in Egyptian. 
as the abode, the couch, or the ark of the four corners, which bears the name of the Typhonian genitrix, or the Satanistic bitch, basically, is a good way to understand the Typhonian genitrix. In that case, the et or the aft would denote the portable shrine, which we have here in Amos 5 and 26 called the tabernacle, the tabernacle of your Molech and Kiyun. You understand? And here, Macy now identifies this for us, denote the portable shrine or the sukkut, the child god, as the aft or the opt was the cradle or the crib. Notice how nigger men used to be saying, I'm going to go to the crib. I'm going to the crib. That means you're still a baby. Frances Cresswell said she tore into that in the ISIS papers as well. A form of the Meshkin. Now, the Hebrew Mishkan, the Mishkan was the tabernacle of the mother and child, the divine or duad, also represented by the branch and the pot of mana. Now we know in the ark of the in the ark there was that, that that pot of manna that was put in there. Now the meaning here, Macy's going to break it down for us. The meaning of Amos is that quote ye have carried the tabernacle of Sikut, who was your Molech or Melak, who was your king, your angel, and Kivan, the genetrix, whose particular star was the Ursa, was Ursa Major. The Ursa Major in the constellation was the star of Molech and Kivan, or the counterfeit um, virgin, uh, the virgin mother and child, in other words, or of the Sut Typhon. Now, Molech is commonly identified with Saturn, who is the planetary type of Sut, or Sut of the Hebraic Sut An, or Satan. On. But the first Molech was called Bar Suit or Molech Bar, who became the Roman god Mulaber, the Mulaber or Mulkeber, the Mulkeber, who was identified with the element of fire. Now, Kivan or the Kun, the Kun, interesting, they call niggas Kun too, right? The Kun was a form of the Taort or the Taor Mut. The oldest mother continued under the serpent type. Now, when you understand Genesis and the tree, you'll recognize why the serpent changed, bended the gender of the tree from the he tree to the she tree. And as soon as the serpent said that to Haywan or to Eve, she basically now, she gravitated to that. That's like when they, when they um, pop all this Satan, modern Satanistic shit to the woman and they, and they make it as something she thing. Now, this is a she thing. It's about us women and all the women. Ah! It's the same kind of deception right there. The serpent is an especial symbol of the great mother. Now, the two truths, there are two truths assigned to her from the first are written with two serpents. These are the mother's hieroglyphics in her two characters of the virgin and the gestator. The two serpents form what's known as the ort the ort or the crown of life, or rather of gestation and maternity. The serpent erected on the cross pole that Moses erected and Christ likened himself, he said, if I be lifted up, I draw all men to me, and I must be lifted up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Well, that serpent erected on the cross pole, or what's known in the Latin, uh, the Greco-Latin as the Stauros, is found in the form of an Egyptian standard crowned with the serpent goddess, the serpent goddess from ancient Egypt, which is known as the Renut. Renut. It's a type of the two truths. She is mounted on a Tau cross, or the T, that T type of cross, and wears the double crown on her head as a standard is the sign of the two lands. Now, Renut, as Renin, it means the virgin. And she is also the goddess of the harvest, that is, of the two periods of pubescence and parturition. Now, Hepha, 
Hepha, H-E-F-A, is the name of the serpent, the great serpent of life. Hepha, also known as Kepha, is identical with the Hebrew Jehovah and Kivan, who were worshipped in the typical wilderness, one whose emblems was the serpent of fire. Fire that vivifies is an Egyptian term for the elements represented by the serpent of life, the heifer. The other of the two primal elements being water. So we have, we have water and fire or fire and water. This was the serpent that was called in the Bible the Nahash, the Nahash. That is the serpent knock on the ash. There was the knock on the ash called Nahash, the tree of life. The same dual figure as that of the serpent twined around the tree, which has so many variations. If you look at some of the old European pictures of the serpent in the garden, you'll notice that it, they have this one where it's like the, the, the person is, is transforming, you know, is transforming from like a serpent lower body to a human upper body. Now the Lord, Yahweh said to Moses, make thee a seraph, meaning make thee a fiery serpent, make thee a burning. Now this is what the Targum of Onkelo says, and lift it up or lift it on an ensign or a standard. In the Egyptian, the sarf, it signifies a flame and a burning, and the ref, the ref, it is the serpent or the reptile. Now, the element of fire, even going a little bit further in this, is very interesting, but we don't want to go too far off of our main point on um, our main point on um, circumcision. We want to at least cover some of the, the basic ideas right here concerning um, the, 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 the circumcision. Now, here's another line here where he says, the Jews charge that the Samaritans, the Jews being the Southerners and the Samaritans being the Northerners, they, they charge the Samaritans not only with the worship of the dove, but also with a form of circumcision that was dedicated to the dove. This was the dove that was synonymous with the sword, and the rite was the reproach of Egypt. Now, I don't know if you all really get where we're going with this, because Columbia, look up Colum, the Colum, or the Columbia means in the Greco-Romantic languages, it actually means... Get this, it means dove. And wherever you see this Columbia goddess or whatnot on their court buildings or other things, she always has the sword. And they say right here, well, this right was the reproach. It was the reproach of Egypt. So now we get to better understand why the Bible calls this place and this reality that we presently are in a spiritual Egypt where we're in a spiritual Egypt in this present time. So one can understand why the Bible is so emphatic that one who has wisdom, one who has the true mythos, you know what I'm saying, will understand this. Now, here it says, another quote, it says, the rock lizard in hieroglyphics is the ideograph of becoming numerous or multiplying. Now, here it says, the rite of circumcision, not in the fanatical phase of castration. Let us understand the difference. That's all we pointed out at the very beginning of this series, that there is the true way, and there's the false way. The false way is a fanatical phase of castration was that of swearing in. So the true circumcision was actually that of swearing in and coveting, covenanting for the reproduction of the human kind, for the reproduction. Now, understanding the, the medical or the hygienic injunction, both in Africa with the AIDS you understand how it prevents heterosexual AIDS transmission, as well as the UTI or the the um, the urinary tract um, infection reduces that, as well as there's a vast reduction in um, cervical cancer. 
which um, certain uncircumcised penises, you understand, can basically produce in the female womb, which will basically cut and break reproduction as well. These are all very, it, it shows there was an ancient wisdom that modern man in his uh, disbelief and disobedience is just coming to understand, understand even in the present even in the um in the present time. Now there's a little bit more on circumcision and let's see if there's anything here that we should we're just going through the highlights, some of the highlights of Macy's book. Um here we have um with some tribes the foreskin was cut off in circumcision with a sharp flint and placed on the third finger of the left hand. In some tribes, and in fact, some tribes still uh, practice this today. An early form, this was an early form of the marriage ring. So when people talk about the marriage ring, understand, please, where the marriage ring really comes from. You know what I'm saying? Employed as a type of reproduction, and it answers, it answers to the seal ring or the chet in the hieroglyphics and the ring of the Hebrews that was worn, as it says right here, by the bridegroom the bridegroom of blood. So now it makes a lot much more sense what Sipara or Zipporah actually said to Moses concerning that, 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 that interesting incident which actually happened. Um, now here it says the customs of circumcision and tattoo were modes of memorizing and means of biting and branding in things that were to be had in everlasting um, remembrance matters relating to the sexes was taught to the children at the period of puberty and the object of ensuring progeny and avoiding disease avoiding disease through uncleanliness or uncleanness and as in the Hebrew the zakar and the memorial they both were identical so this knowledge, some say that, well, it was a rite in Egypt, but maybe it didn't have, maybe they didn't understand it had to do with cleansiness. Only fools, you understand, or deceivers would say that. They understood, and they also knew the significance of this. You know and we have to remember that humanity is much, has a much longer date than white supremacy. You understand, in other words, many of these things we're going through, we're going through again. Now, this is another interesting area where Macy talks about the, the Batoka tribes. Said they knocked the front teeth out of their children's mouth at pure, pu puberty. The Batoka tribes, they knocked the front teeth out of their children's mouth at pure puberty. It's a custom which they performed at the same age that circumcision was in other tribes to make it resemble, check it out, to make it resemble oxen. They knocked the front teeth out of their children's mouth at puberty to make it resemble oxen or bullocks because the bulls which have been gelt or been castrated. This can be read in the same way. It was a lesser form of the sacrifice practiced in circumcision by castration in the cult of the Aten son, the Hebrew Adonai, and of the semi-castration formerly practiced by the Hottentot, the Hottentot tribes. Now, when Lucian or Lucian left his hair as an offering to the goddess and her son in the temple of Herapolis, the meaning of the rite was the same, although the type of adult ship had been changed. Hair, tooth, and uh, testiculus, or the testicles, was each a type of puberty, as well as, get this, as well as testify. So when they say, uh, you want to testify, let us understand what the original types of this basically were. You understand? So this, this is our first quote. The first quote, we're going to end off where the first quote is. And this is the first quote by Macy here, that the Stone Age of Egypt is visible in the stone knife that has continued to be used for the purpose of circumcision. In other words, there was a stone age in ancient Egypt, and they used these stone knives. 
And this is interesting that in in um, in uh, Exodus, where Zipporah she circumcises her two um, her and Moses's two boys, that she uses also a particular kind of flint, a stone knife too. Right, and they use the same type of stone knife in the preparation, in the preparation of 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 the mummies, of the mummies. So we really need to understand this this whole thing about circumcision a lot much more carefully, my brothers and sisters, because there is much more. You know, saying there is much more to this than meets the uninformed and the misinformed eyes and ears. So hopefully we'll be able to continue on this particular subject matter a little bit a little bit more. What we're gonna do at this present time is uh take a pause for the cause. And um thank you, my brothers and sisters and others for listening to this and for viewing this particular production. Shalom, Ras Tafari.